I'm going to be talking about the meaning of life's milestones, uh, but on a kind of two-for-one offer, I'm actually going to start with the meaning of life itself, just to sort of, a <laughs> uh, bit of an extra, just to get you going. Um, uh, I'm planning to talk for about uh, 25 uh, minutes, rather than hours, and, uh, and then we're going to go into a conversation here with Jonathan, and then there'll be uh, questions, and I hope a more informal dialogue. Uh, if I say things as I'm going through that you find offensive or challenging, uh, that's great. Um, so have your uh, squash tomatoes ready to lob uh, whenever, whenever you like. Um, I'm also going to pace up and down a bit, so um, apologies if I block the screen sometimes. Um, the talk I'm going to give is based around, as Jonathan said, this uh, new book called Driving with Plato, which is the follow-up to Breakfast with Socrates. Um, so I think I'm now thinking of trademarking the word with, because uh, <laughs> clearly it, uh, there's some sort of brand identity there. Um, so the meaning of life, clearly a pretty overblown question. And before getting into it, before getting too excited that there is a meaning to life, let's just consider the uh, reverse, the alternative possibility that there isn't. Um, and this uh, chap, does anybody recognize? Sartre, yes. Jean-Paul Sartre, um, you know, perhaps one of the most famous uh, thinkers of the 20th century, of course, uh, corrected the idea that there is a meaning to life at all. And I just want to briefly uh, say what his thinking was. And he argued that effectively we are just cast into the world utterly at random. And if you think about your own life now and the fact that you are of a certain gender, of a certain class, of a certain nationality, and of a certain age. I mean, it's all pretty arbitrary, in a sense. I mean, you didn't really, you didn't plan to do any of those things, partly because you hadn't been born and so you couldn't plan anything. And so there's an essential randomness, or what, what Sartre calls contingency about life, that we're, that we're thrown into. And that makes life essentially meaningless. I mean, it doesn't have meaning, according to Sartre. Except, and here's the uh, silver lining to the cloud, that if life is fundamentally meaningless, uh, there's nothing to prevent us from generating a meaning for ourselves, right? Because there's nothing transcendent, superordinate, which is uh, dictating what the, the meaning of life should be. There's no God, for example, according to Sartre. And so we can make it up for ourselves. So meaninglessness is actually an opportunity rather than a, a threat. And in particular, he says, we've got to make a shift. A shift from being born in this state of arbitrary random contingency, which he calls en soi, en soi, in oneself, just being born in oneself, just there, to becoming pour soi, for yourself. So giving purpose, essentially creating purpose for your life. So this is the shift you've got to make from being en soi to pour soi. And for Sartre, the main way of doing this is to commit act, to act. It's no good being passive, you've got to be active. And for Sartre, the epitome of an act, the kind of act to be recommended above anything else in order to give meaning to your life is a political one. If you want to give meaning to your life, act politically. And Sartre, as you may know, uh, was a very active member of the Communist Party in France and marched on the streets and was a leading figure, a luminary, an inspiration for the student riots, for example, in 1968 in, in Paris. So that's just, before we get to rah-rah uh, about the idea that there is meaning, let's uh, entertain the possibility that there isn't. But uh, with that caveat in mind, I want to give you three other classic answers to what the meaning of life might be. And then I'm going to break life down briefly into some of its milestones from cradle to grave. And I'll be picking out just a few moments, like starting school, having your first kiss, um, uh, getting divorced, getting married. <laughs> of course, there's a link. <laughs> there's a link, I guess, there. Uh, not everybody goes through these in all the same sequence, by the way, but um, 
I'll pick out one or two. And I will be talking about death at the end, of course, as a, just to leave you on a high. Um, so some classic answers to what the uh, meaning of life might be. Well, here's a famous image from Leonardo, which, uh, to put it very simply, is said to express the spirit of the Renaissance. If Leonardo, if anybody's a Renaissance man, it must be Leonardo. And in a sense, this expresses the spirit of the Renaissance, which is that we no longer simply have to appreciate the perfection of God, but as God's special creatures, we can bring perfection in ourselves to life. So one way of making your life meaningful is to perfect yourself, to make yourself as perfect as possible. And if you think that sounds a bit overambitious, um, I mean, in a sense, it's the premise that the whole self-help industry is based on. I mean, we might not call it self-perfection, but we certainly call it self-improvement, the idea that you can um, transform your life, that you can become better, happier, more loving, kinder, um, and more perfect in every way. So that's, that's one classic answer, which, as I say, underpins pretty much the self-help industry. And it's the idea of the perfection of the self. And I think you can date it. It's a generalization, but I think you can date it roughly to this idea of the perfectibility of the human being, which is sort of a Renaissance humanist concept. And see people shaking their heads. And I guess those New Year's resolutions are already wearing off, right? So. You think it's much earlier? Christianity. Yes, it goes back to Christianity. It does, indeed. Well, the idea, I mean, if, if man is made in the image of God, as the Bible alleges, then in a sense we've got an implicit perfection already within us. So uh, to be able to express that um, is, in a sense, the task that we are faced with. And indeed, I mean, you're quite right, the, the roots of humanism lie much earlier in Augustine and in Gnosticism, which says that there is a divine spark within us that can be brought alive which always uh, makes me think of the word enthusiasm. I don't know if you know this, but the word enthusiasm literally means to have God inside you. It's en, the theos, is a, as in theology or Zeus. So to be enthusiastic is to be filled with God, to be filled with that vital sort of divine spark, effectively. Uh, don't let me get distracted. <laughs> Another classic answer to uh, the meaning of life and how to create it is, of course, to devote yourself to others. Here's... Florence Nightingale uh, m uh, administering to soldiers in a field hospital. And, of course, um, the idea of self-sacrifice, altruism, is a classic answer to, uh, to achieving meaning. And, you know, a lot of work is being done at the moment on the concept of happiness. David Cameron and others are now taking that up and uh, kind of sponsoring projects around it. And, of course... It's very common for these happiness projects to discover that the greatest happiness is found not through self-interest, in fact, but through helping others. So here's another classic answer to how you create meaning in your life. Second answer. Here's a third classic answer, which is not the perfection of the self, but service to God per se. So you, as it were, bypass the realm of the human and give yourself over to service. Now... Um, these things aren't incompatible. Of course, the dedication to others, devoting yourself to others, can be a form of service to God. You know, it can be a, a realisation of it. And if you think of characters like, I don't know, Mother Teresa, of course, the service to God gets manifested as devotion to others. But this is another uh, classic answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? One could be to connect yourself to God. And I'll just throw in an extra one uh, before I start breaking this thing down into milestones by referring to this uh, chapter. Anybody recognize? Yeats. Yeah, absolutely. W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet, who says uh, in one of his prose, rather peculiar prose writings, it has to be said, but it says in one of his prose writings that we have to make a choice, we, ha we have to make a choice between life and work. Right? You can't have both. You can't have your cake and eat it. Now, this is quite um, challenging, I think, for us moderns who talk about things like work-life balance as though we might be able to get the best of both. But Yeats says, no, you can, you can either have one or the other. So if you want to be a great artist in particular, you've got to dedicate yourself to that completely. You can't be an obsessive great genius and also do the washing up. Um, in saying which, I'm actually quoting 
Philip Larkin, who of course poo-pooed this idea that geniuses didn't do the washing up. He felt that uh, they very much should be part of the world. But for Yeats, no, uh, producing great art is actually a way of transcending everyday concerns. And so you've got to completely throw yourself into it. And um, of course, you sort of realize this. If you go and see a lot of art, or like I do, if you're very interested in paintings, you'll notice a lot of artists are quite obsessive about their work, and they work all day long on, um, on their particular vision and, uh, and not let up until it's, until it's done. You know, there's something all-consuming about producing artworks. And Yeats, in a sense, would recommend this, this idea that you can have both, for him, as a fantasy, and uh, work, in that sense, can produce the greatest meaning uh, in life. And, of course, we know... Um, in a more ordinary sense, that work can produce meaning. Um, there are stories about, I know there are counterexamples, but there are plenty of stories about people who retire only to find that they've lost the sense of purpose because work provided such a strong sense of purpose. Now, obviously, there are plenty of other stories that uh, say the reverse, but there is something about work which, in creating purpose, rewards us with a sense of meaning, gives us a sense of direction. So I just wanted to, uh, that's the, that was the uh, extra bonus two-for-one offer, some, a few thoughts about the meaning of life en général. And now I just want to pick out a few of the milestones uh, that nearly all of us go through. Now, um, I'm doing this because the question of the meaning of life is often too big, and it's a sense that we need to eat the elephant. If you want to eat the elephant, you have to eat it bite by bite. Now... Since cutting and pasting this picture into my slide deck, I have driven myself mad trying to work out how many legs this darn creature has. <laughs> it is kind of brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's unintentional, but uh, I think my answer is that it's got five feet but four legs, which maybe is a kind of metaphor for um, the meaning of life. Anyway. Um, so clearly, uh, our life begins by being born. And uh, although this is obvious, something interesting takes place the moment we're born, which is that our life splits and goes down two different tracks. One track is physical and the other track is mental. Now, the physical track, you can never get off. You can never get off the track of time physically. You will just continue to get older and older and older. Nothing you can do about that. Your body exists in time. You can't rewind, despite, you know, L'Oreal ads, you can't turn the <laughs> clock back and become younger. Nor, actually, can you become, you know, older than you are. You, you know, you are in time. You age at the rate that time passes. Your body is absolutely on that track. Your mind, however, and this, I think, is the uh, gift, the genius, the opportunity that the human mind presents is capable of uncoupling itself, decoupling itself from that track of time. Your mind doesn't exist in a forward sequence going from minute to minute, hour to hour, Monday to Tuesday. All of you, even now, could be thinking about what you're going to be having for lunch after this, what you did yesterday, the argument you had with your partner last week, what you're going to do next year, what you're going to do later today. You're, or even though you're sitting here in this room and are obliged to, well, more or less obliged to sit here for the course of the lecture, and your body will pass through time as we do that, your mind can hop all over the place. Right? So there's this, this splitting that happens from the moment you're born. And this capacity that the human mind has not to live in the present, although it's criticised sometimes from a kind of Buddhist perspective, which says you must always live in the present, is actually, I would argue one of the greatest gifts we have. It's actually the source of the imagination, the, the ability not to live in the present, to hop about through time, to project forward and to recollect from the past, indeed to manufacture or fabricate pictures and images that have never existed or might never exist, for me is one of the extraordinary facets of human life. And it happens from the moment we're born. Conceivably, it happens even before we're born. I mean. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, there is some evidence that even babies dream, for example, so that in the womb will dream in the womb. 
uh, which suggests again that, that it's possible that the human brain, even that, uh, at that early stage of development, is capable of, as it were, living outside its physical moment. Let me pick out one or two others. Um, clearly, I, I noticed there was on the list of people uh, who've signed up to come to this talk today that there was a yoga teacher. So I've been very conscious of my posture as well, I've been talking. Um, I just want to say something quickly about learning to walk. There's a um, has anybody here done Alexander Technique or know what, what it is? Right. I did it very uh, briefly a few years ago. And my Alexander Technique teacher insisted that um, the kind of Darwinian idea that we have become fully upright human beings evolving from monkeys might be correct up to a point, but is also misleading. Because it assumes that we have evolved further than we have. According to Alexander Technique, those of you who've done it, the, the correct way to stand is not like a sergeant major with your you know, chest out and your coccyx sort of flaring like that, even though that's how your mum or dad might have told you to stand or sit at the table. In fact, it's to stand with your knees slightly bent and your back flat like this. In other words, not completely at the far right hand of this picture, but a little bit further back. In other words, we might have evolved somewhat less than we think we have. So although walking defines, in a sense, what it is to be a human, the biped, the homo sapiens who can uh, walk about and make its way out of the savannah, it's, it's possible uh, that we haven't come as quite as far as we'd like to think. Let me keep going. Uh, I'll skip over some of these, just because we don't have time. Starting school, um, it's a very formal looking schoolroom. Of course, schools these days uh, don't really look like that. I dropped my youngest daughter, who's four, off at school this morning, and of course there are circular desks and they sit in clumps and the teachers are all very friendly and so on, and all the artwork is on the, on the wall. But of course, the, the concept of school is pretty formal, and consider this. Of the milestones that we go through in life, this is the first one, perhaps, that's purely cultural. I mean, after learning to walk and talk, school is really our first, at least last, uh, large-scale exposure to something entirely artificial. We didn't have to go to school. Even though it's ubiquitous, nearly universal, uh, going to school isn't natural. You know, it doesn't have to happen. You don't go to school like you, like your milk, like you lose your milk teeth. You know, it doesn't just happen. It is imposed in some way. And indeed, for there's a French writer called Louis Althusser, more or less contemporary with Sartre, as it happens, who goes so far to say as not only a school arbitrary, but it is an instrument of the state. He calls it an ideological state apparatus, apparatus, an ISA, whose, whose role, the role of school, is to manufacture compliant citizens. That is the role of a school, according to Althusser. So although, you know, I take my daughter along to this lovely school she goes to and it's all about development and potential, perhaps I'm being entirely hoodwinked, according to Althusser. No, no. The point is to produce normative, normatively um, standardised citizens who behave in a certain way and don't rock the boat. Uh, now, having your first kiss. I'll just quickly uh, talk about this. Can you remember your first kiss? Most people can. It's sort of literally sealed on the, uh, on the memory. Um, I'm going to talk about three types of kiss. Uh, no, not, not in that sense. Uh, I know we've had a couple of French references, but as, as far as it goes. Um, uh, and I'm going to do this through the lens of psychoanalysis, because psychoanalysis has something very interesting to say about kissing. Essentially, our first kiss isn't a kiss in an amatory or romantic sense. It is the oral contact with the mother that comes, again, very early in life through suckling and through being fed, effectively. And uh, do you know, have you come across a man called Desmond Morris, who's a kind of a zoologist? Well, he says uh, that one of the reasons why kissing in later life feels so good is because it seems to recall what it was like to uh, feel sustained by the mother. And he draws an analogy with 
monkeys, going back to apes, passing food from the mother to the baby, so they chew it, it's slightly disgusting, uh, it's lunchtime, but um, you know, the mother will chew the food and then pass it orally to the baby. And, and this sense of sustenance that comes from that relationship is one we retain and recall, and it's one of the reasons why later in life we think of kissing as such a pleasurable thing. So reg you know, regardless of any erotic content it might have, this notion of being sustained and this echo of maternal care lies behind it. So this is the first stage. That's the first kind of psychoanalytic kiss, if you like, because it, it recalls the proximity to the mother. The second kind <clears throat> is weird. We lose, as we wean, we lose an object to kiss, right? And we're, our sexuality hasn't developed. We, you know, we haven't entered puberty yet. So between the ages of, what, you know, 2 and 12, roughly, we are devoid of an object to kiss. And we'd like that because it brings gratification. And so we fantasise about the possibility of kissing ourselves, right? We may not actually go up to the mirror and try and do that. But this, for Freud at least, is a central fantasy in early life, that we can have a um, kind of self-satisfying relationship with ourselves. And for him, it's part of the origin of narcissism. You know, this, the, the fact that we have to gratify ourselves on our own without an object like a mother to enable that to happen. So this is the second verse, kind of grotesque image, the idea of a mouth kissing itself or trying to kiss yourself. And narcissism isn't a good word, but in a way it's a response... You know, narcissism, although we think of narcissism as a bad thing, a form of vanity, it's actually perhaps just a normal reaction to the fact that we've lost that relationship with the mother. So we create a relationship with ourselves to compensate for it. Third one is then the proper amatory kiss when you're a teenager, usually. I was 15. And um, uh, what that does effectively is find an object again. And this is what's healthy and proper. It's having an object to kiss that facilitates uh, sexual maturity, effectively. So there's three types of kiss. There's the early infantile one, there's the narcissistic lack of one, and then finally there's the romantic, amatory one with an object who is not, crucially, your mother. <clears throat> your first kiss. Um, everybody winces when I show this. Slide. I think people, a lot of people still have dreams about having to retake exams. Um, I think it's one of the most common ones, um, losing a virginity. As I said, these things don't often go in this sequence necessarily, but um, I want to talk about getting married uh, briefly. Uh, I've got five, five minutes or so to go. And um, although um, I mean, we have rather divided views about marriage, on the one hand, you know, it's an object of a lot of comedy and so on. On the other hand, it's quite a big event. It's a big milestone in people's lives for those people who do marry. But I just wanted to say something about the quality of the promise. Because a marriage service is nothing without a promise. You know, you promise something to somebody else in the presence of witnesses. And this idea of promising is a very strong one because it says... No matter what happens, in sickness and he or in health, come hell or high water, we'll stick together. So a promise is a way of laying a beam across the uncertainty of future events and saying, I will make this happen despite the chaos, unforeseeability, contingency of events. So a promise is a human will, an act of will, that imposes uh, an intent in the face of things that might disrupt it. You know, it's a very powerful thing in that sense. You know, it's saying, I will master the future. I will do my best to make the future conform to what I want it to conform to, in the face of chance. So although we don't necessarily take it always uh, that seriously, the, the marriage vow as a promise says something very important about our ability as humans to structure the future, or at least to try to structure the future and project over time. Um, uh, having a midlife crisis. Um, just a quick thought on this. Um, my sense of what the problem with mid midlife crisis is that, or what causes it, is that when you reach a certain 
age. I turned 46 last week, so I think I'm in absolute prime territory for midlife crisis. But I think when you reach a certain age, um, you begin to lose your sense of yourself in the future. You, in other words, you don't have a role model of yourself in the future. You have a picture of yourself in the past, and a lot of midlife crisis is actually about nostalgia. It's, you know, so the 46-year-old man who buys himself a Porsche is effectively trying to go back to an image of himself as younger. If he buys himself an electric guitar or does any other, gets a new trophy girlfriend. These are, in a sense, signs of going backwards in life. It's nostalgia. It's because our images of ourselves when we were younger are so strong and compelling at this sort of age compared with our pictures of ourselves in the future. So if I think of myself at 76 as opposed to 26, it's not just because it's in the future and hard to see. It's that we don't have very many positive images of what 76-year-olds are like, right? We just don't. So having a midlife crisis is, in a sense, a response to that dearth of positive images for the future. And I think, given that we're all going to live to 100, or many of us, this capacity to generate positive images of ourselves in the future is going to be one of the key skills we need to build for ourselves. Absolutely key. You know, how do we become our own role model in the future? And just finally, um, that's Henry VIII, um, because time is against us, I want to say something about the Grim Reaper. Of course, there are things that happen between retiring and dying. So. Um, although, interestingly, writing this book, uh, you know, our lives are front-loaded. There are more milestones, as we call them, in the first 20 or 30 years than there are in the subsequent period of our life. And so if we are going to live to 100, you know, what does that mean? Are we going to just have more time to reflect on the few things that happened early on? You know, another argument, I think, for self-reinvention, positive images in our later life. Now, uh, just a quick word about dying. Um, Martin Heidegger, who's a formidable and very important German philosopher you may have heard of, 20th century German philosopher, says a number of things about dying. For me, one of the crucial things he says about it is that uh, only you can die your death. Right? It can't be outsourced. He doesn't say that, but that's what he means. Right? It's absolutely, he, co he co coins this phrase, it's own most. It's our own most uh, destiny to die our own deaths. Right? Nobody can die your death for you. And this is one of its, his most um, critical insights. Now, you might think, well, hang on a minute, I can die for somebody else. What about sacrifice? Right? But the counter-counter example is, no, 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 it's sacrifice, you don't die for somebody else. You still die your own death. It's just you're taking the bullet for them instead. Right? So probably the greatest sacrifice, or most natural sacrifice, one could make is to die for one's children, to be uh, grave about it for a moment. But if I die for my children, I'm not dying their death in doing so. I'm still dying my death, but I'm preventing them from having their death, um, having their life sn snatched away. So sacrifice isn't really taking the place of somebody else. It's just doing an honourable thing. It's still your own death that you die. Now, that itself is important, but for me it says something else about milestones, and this is my th thought I just want to end on, which is about uh, what I'll call, again, to be quite serious about it, um, essential solitude, which is a phrase used by uh, another writer called Maurice Blanchot. I, I want to steal this phrase because I like it. <clears throat> and what struck me uh, writing this book about milestones is that it's not just dying that nobody else can do for you. It's nearly all of our key milestones. So, for example, you saw the slide taking exams. One of the things that makes taking exams so terrifying is precisely that you can't say to your mate, hey, do you mind, do you mind taking the exam for me? You can't say to somebody, like my, my oldest daughter is now taking a driving test. I can't, she can't say to me, Dad, will you take my driving test for me? Right. Only she can take that. It can't be delegated. Um, it's the case even with more, and you don't even think about milestones, uh, more ordinary things like going to the dentist or something. You can't ask somebody else to go to the dentist for you, right? Or, or going to the gym. I mean, if only. 
can you imagine? It'd be a paying, how much would you pay to get someone to go and go to the gym for you? You know, they're off sweating away, toiling on the treadmill, all right? Half an hour later, you go to the bathroom, weigh yourself, ah, oh, I lost a pound. <laughs> Okay? You, ca you just can't do it. There are things in life, milestones in particular, which cannot be devolved. And for me, this speaks to the fact that, to sound a bit uh, dark about it, we are, you know, we are given a certain kind of solitude. That's what it is to be alive. There is something which we just cannot get rid of, which only pertains to us. And if that is one pole of our lives. The other pole, therefore, is the fact that we don't have to just be islands. We can launch out and make contact with other people. And for me, these are essentially, this is the kind of conclusion I've come to writing this book, these are the two poles we work between. It's on the one hand, essential solitude that is just our fate. Nobody else can take it from us. It's just our fate, on the one hand. And on the other hand, the ability we have, nevertheless, to cast our boats from the island and make contact with others. And we are constantly in this play, if you like, between uh, an, an undoable solitude on the one hand and a kind of mitigating, compensating, being with others, sociability, connecting, love, um, forming together with others. So uh, it's just a brief insight into um, what I've spoken about in my book. And I'll stop there, Jonathan, if that's OK. And, uh, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> Great, thanks a lot, Robert. I want to um, uh, sort of began, begin where you end, in a sense, because um, you frame this sort of pattern of life cycle as a sort of, you know, a sort of dynamic between the desire for inclusion and the need for independence or the, yeah. the sort of essential solitude and the, the opportunity of reaching out to others. And there's a, a psychologist in the U.S. called Robert Keegan, who actually believes that's precisely what propels, you know, adult development. In the same way that yeah. Piaget theorized, you know, infancy to adulthood in a certain way, that same pattern can carry on. But the same author, in a subsequent book, wrote about wrote about being in over our heads. And what he meant by that was the the kind of complexity we develop as we, do, you know, grow up, um, is often insufficient to deal with the demands of life. And I wanted to use that to ask about your first slide, which is about the meaninglessness of life. Because my perception is that your average sort of 20, 30, 40 something living in the UK or living in London especially, is life is not so much meaningless, but you know, too meaningful. It's like there's a surfeit of meaning. You're expected to be several different people, expected to know many different things. Uh, there's an abundance of relationships. There's old friends you've lost touch with. There's all sorts of um, pressures not so much to give your life meaning, but to sort of fend off the meaning and, and, and simplify it. <laughs> so I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, uh, I like the question. That's very interesting. Um, I guess I'd make a distinction between meaning and identity there, because I think uh, what I hear and what you're saying is that we are asked to be all sorts of people all of the time and to play different roles. Um, I, mean, I mentioned work-life balance, and you know any... Uh, mother that you know um, who's also trying to do a job will often say, you know, I'm these two very different people. At work I have to be this professional in the dry clean suit, you know, and at home I've got babysick all down my, you know, uh, or my, you know, track, track uh, shirt or whatever. So I think there is, uh, there's this sense in which we're bombarded with having to be different identities at different times. And I think that's different from meaning. And in a sense, it's the proliferation of identities which stops us from getting at you know, who we are and the meaning of who we are. I think the upside, I'm, I think there is an upside to this. I think the, um, the fact now that it's more and more difficult to maintain this difference between private and public life. So, for example, you, know, you can go to work and people sneakily are looking at Facebook on their computers during their lunch break or even not during their lunch break. It means that they're already seeing people at work also in their non-work mode, right? We know what people are like. You know, we see them, you know, at a drinks party with their friends on Facebook, even as they're coming into offi an office with their suit and tie on. And that's overcoming the difference, I think, between these different identities slowly over time. I think it's going to be more and more difficult for us to uh, play these very separate demarcated or compartmentalised roles. And technology is doing a lot to change that. I don't think it's a bad thing, actually. I think the more we we are integrated humans and are happy for people to see us 
you know, as True. single individuals is probably a good thing. But integration is a definite achievement, right? If you, yeah. if you actually manage to get your life together, which is what, yeah. which is the challenge. Um, but in the same way, the, the way you present the milestones, although you say it's not a strict chronology and it doesn't always follow one from the other, yeah. it does suggest a certain patterning and coherence and order that many people may not experience as they live their life. A lot of it is sort of retrospective. Yeah, that's right. Um, and my impression is that a lot of, when I was doing my doctoral work, we had a big sort of research center there about narrative therapy. And it was all about mm. uh, people telling their life stories to come to terms with things they've been through. Um, but a lot of that is sort of almost, uh, you know, constructing milestones or, or trying to give them, give them definition, give them meaning. Um, and very often they're through events in other people's lives. You know, there, it's not so much that your first kiss, but your, your, your uh, partner's first kiss with some other person, or it's your, the loss, loss, of a, loss of a relative, or losing, you know, someone else losing their job and the burden that had on you. So my, my impression when I read this book was that for an individual, it speaks very strongly to the sort of self-identity project. But very often that identity project is just hijacked from all sides. Mm. And... Um, you know, therefore, it becomes quite difficult to, to give life meaning in that, that way because other people are giving it to you all the time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there are, the kind of vicariousness cuts both ways. I mean, just as you can sort of see the meaning that is being lived out by other people, I think so, uh, equally, uh, you can become meaningful in other people's eyes. I mean, I mentioned the example of children. I think that's critical, you know... Um, I mean, whether you like it, you know, you, if you have children, you are meaningful to your children. You know, you are meaning, you are meaning to them. You know, you are meaningful to your own parents. You know, you don't have to generate your own meaning just, just by where you are in a system, whether it's a family system or a work system. You know, you are, you carry value for other people. Sometimes value might be somewhat negative. But nevertheless, you are positioned by others and have a value for others. I mean, think of... I mean, I'm also at that age where a lot of my friends are now divorcing. Right? They've had their first marriage and now they're on to their second or, in some cases, third or whatever. And uh, one of the things that you realise is that when people split up, they think it's all about them. What they really appreciate is that we, your friends, were invested in that marriage too. You know, it's a bit of a blow to us. We came to the ceremony, we bought you presents... <laughs> We, you know, went out for dinner with you afterwards, we, not grudgingly. Uh, you know, we looked at the photos, and we had our own, you know, projection about this. So you were meaningful to us as a married couple. You're just obsessed with your own breakup, but it kind of means something to us too. So I think, you know, we have reflected meaning in all sorts of ways. Okay. And finally, from me before I open up, yeah. um, a question a little bit more abstract about what you would want people to get from this book, because... You know, we come here for an hour's reprieve. We all sort of transcended for an hour away from our normal lives. And equally, when we read the book, we get to, you know, drive with Plato and have breakfast with Socrates and so on and so forth. We get the sort of rich perspective from uh, deeper, deeper sort of perspectives on our life. But nonetheless, for most people, when they finish the book, do you expect them to be entertained, transformed? Uh, how, how would you want to frame it? What would you really hope would be the you know, optimal sort of reading experience in that way? Yes. Well, all of the above, of course. Um, Disgusted? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, it's a cliche, but I, I, I do come back to that notion um, associated with Socrates that the unexamined life is not worth living. I think although reflecting on your life can bring levels of introspection that people often think are unhealthy. I think not being introspective is actually missing a whole dimension of your life. You know, the capacity for self-reflection is one of the things that makes humans allegedly different from other creatures on the planet. I mean, we may find out that's not true at some point. And uh, it's like you have keys to an inner world uh, which is, you know, as large as the outer world. And I think that's I think the opportunity to explore the self is a, is a great gift. So you're kind of a locksmith of sorts. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> a philosophical great. locksmith. Yeah. Great.